Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and we've got yet another mini PC to take a look at today. This one from B-Link. This is their Sur 8 and this one has the Ryzen 8745 processor on board. I'll talk about why that's important in a second. It is a nicely performing mini PC in the upper levels of performance for these types of devices. And we're gonna take a closer look at it and see how it performs in just a second. But I do wanna let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this came in free of charge from B-Link. However, no other compensation was received. They have not reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. And all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. So let's get into it now and see what this mini PC is all about. Now the price point on this will fluctuate quite a bit from time to time, but at the moment it's selling for just under $500. Be sure when you are looking at this on Amazon that you click on whatever coupon link might be next to it because typically these are sold at a higher price and they have a pretty large coupon next to it to bring that price down to something more reasonable. Now inside, this has a Ryzen 8745HS processor. You may also find a version that costs a little bit more with an 8845HS. As you will see in a few minutes, there's not much of a performance difference between the 87 and the 8845 chip. I think the big difference here is that the 8745 that this one has lacks the NPU that is often used for on-device artificial intelligence. That NPU is in the more expensive 8845 version. I don't think you need that for most tasks that I think people are shopping for on these devices. So you can save a little bit if you don't need that NPU. Additionally, this has 32 gigabytes of RAM and a one terabyte NVMe SSD. You can upgrade the RAM and the storage. So you can bring the RAM up to a whopping 256 gigabytes if you swap out those RAM modules there. And you also have two NVMe slots. One of them will be occupied by the hard drive it comes with, but you'll have a free spot next to it. And they've got a nice big heat sink on top of both of those drives to keep them cool. So overall, a very nicely upgradable device that is relatively reasonably priced. Now, as far as ports are concerned, you've got a bunch of them on this machine. You've got a headphone microphone jack here right in the front, along with two 10 gigabit per second USB ports, a USB-C and a USB-A. The power button is here on the front and not on the bottom like the new Mac Mini has. On the back here, you've got two USB-A ports. The top one is a 10 gigabit per second port. The lower one is a 480 megabit per second USB-2 port and they don't label it, so you do have to make sure you get your higher speed devices plugged into that top one on the back. There's another USB 2 port over here. You have a uh, 2.5 gigabit ethernet on the back, and I did test that a little bit earlier during a live stream, and we were able to get the full uh, 2.5 gigabit per second speeds both on the download and as it cycles over to the upload here on the upload side as well. So all in a nicely performing, a uh, 2.5 gigabit ethernet there. You have three ways to output video on this. You have a display port, an HDMI, and a USB 4 port that runs at 40 gigabits per second. So you could have three displays coming out the back of this. I also put the data rates of that port to the test using a Thunderbolt SSD. And there we got pretty much the full speed that I expect out of that Thunderbolt drive, driving about two gigabytes per second back and forth through that port. It was a little slower on the writes, but just by a couple hundred megabytes, but still it looks like you could plug in an external GPU on this without issue. Note though that this doesn't have an Oculink port like that GMK Tech PC we saw recently. So your only option is to plug in a Thunderbolt enclosure into that USB 4 port. And then next to it, you've got the barrel connector for the included power supply here. This is a 100 watt power supply. It looks like a GAN power supply, which is why it is on the smaller side. And the AMD chip on this runs at a 65 watt TDP. All right, let's take a look now and see how it performs. We've got it running at 4K 60 here on my display. We'll head over to the nasa.gov homepage. As you can see, everything here just spins right up without much delay. You can get videos going here without any lag at all. I am sure most of what you would do from an office standpoint will run fine here. It is super quick as you would expect and that's due to the fact that you've got a pretty beefy Ryzen processor here under the hood. One issue I ran into it though was the Wi-Fi performance. It is not as good as it could be. It does have an Intel AX 
uh, Wi-Fi 6 radio on board. And when you go and do a speed test like we did a minute ago on the Ethernet, you'll see the performance isn't as good as it should be. It does get a little better than what it started at here. But I was having a hard time getting beyond like three or 400 megabits per second in either direction. And I think it might be due to the case here. It is all metal, which is great from a build quality perspective, but I think it might hurt the Wi-Fi performance a little bit. And this is something I heard from some other viewers who own one of these devices. So Ethernet is going to perform much better than Wi-Fi will on this without having to rig up some secondary antenna. So hopefully they address that in future iterations. But as you can see from the basic standpoint, the performance is quite good on this one. Let's take a look at YouTube now. All right, so here's a 4K 60 frames per second video playing back from my YouTube channel. And if we jump in and look at the stats for nerds here, you can see that we did drop a few frames when I was getting everything set up, but after that, it all settled right down and it's able to keep up with that video without any further decoding issues. And I would expect nothing less out of a modern Ryzen processor like this. So I think this should be decent enough for watching movies and stuff along with your YouTube and Twitch activities. Just note that I am still not recommending mini PCs as home theater devices, especially for playing back 4K movies. And it's not because of the performance issues, it's because of support for HDR modes like Dolby Vision and some of the other things that we see on most of the modern streaming platforms. You're still better off, I think, with a set-top box that will be a lot less expensive. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, we got a score of 20.9 which happens to be the same score we got on an 8845-based mini PC from GMK Tech last week. Additionally, you can see it's also the same score we got on an Intel Core Ultra 5 mini PC. So this one really performs right where it should at the top of the mini PC performance scale there. Also of note, though, is the Mac Mini M4, which came in with a much higher score at 42.9. And for light video editing, even at 4K60, this machine should perform just fine thanks to the Ryzen graphics built in. Uh, what we're going to do here is drop in a cross dissolve and go ahead and play back and see how quickly it renders in here. And as you can see, it did that without any real lag or slowdown. And I think your experience doing some basic kind of editing, similar to what I do here, is going to be very good. You can probably get away with a little bit more than just this simple kind of stuff going into color grading and some other things as well. But if you're doing some higher end work where you really need very fast real time previews, that's where having a discrete GPU will come in much handier. And of course, you can attach one to this. But for the type of editing that I do on this YouTube channel, and I suspect the type of editing that many people do these days for social media, this is more than adequate. All right, let's move on to some games now. A little bit earlier on a live stream, we ran a bunch. This is Red Dead Redemption 2. We're running this at 1080p at the lowest settings, and we were getting between 50 and 60 frames per second. It was usually just under 60, but still very, very, very playable, even at 1080p, and you could squeeze a little more performance out of it at 720p. This is No Man's Sky. We were running this at 1080p, also at the lowest settings. And on this, we were getting about 45 to 60 frames per second. Things vary in this game quite a bit because you go from going into space to being on the surface of a planet where a whole bunch of stuff has to get rendered in. Uh, but I found the performance here to be just as playable. So if you were uh, looking to play some games like these two, it should be just fine. We also took a look at Doom Eternal. And this one we ran at... 1080p, also at the lowest settings, and here we were able to get between 60 and 75 frames per second. It did slow down a little bit when you've got some more characters on screen versus what we're doing here, hopping around, but it generally stayed above 60, and this is a really well-optimized game here. So from a gaming perspective, this machine performs quite well. Now, it's also a pretty competent emulation device. This is a PS2 emulator running Burnout Revenge at the default settings. This was running at a solid 60 almost the entire time, so no issues there. And I think you could probably run everything from the PS2 backwards in time. So as an emulation box, I think there's a lot of potential uh, given the Ryzen processor under the hood here. And on the 3 d Mark Time Spy benchmark test, we got a score of 3,336. This is right within the margin of error with what we saw on an 8845HS-based mini PC, so no performance difference here between the 8845 and the 8745, at least for gaming and all of the other stuff that you just saw me test on it. And on the 3D Mark Stress Test, we got a passing grade of 99.6%. 
So even under heavy sustained load, it's able to maintain its performance. And again, the fan on this is very, very quiet. From a power consumption standpoint, I'm seeing it hitting almost to the 100 watt mark, the maximum that that power supply can deliver. It maxes out at around 99 watts and change. And that's when you're playing a game or doing some higher end video rendering and that sort of thing. On the idle side, it's usually around 15 to 20 watts just sitting at the desktop here. All right, one last thing to take a look at, and that is its support for Linux. I booted up the most recent version of Ubuntu. It all works just fine. The Wi-Fi works, the sound works, the Bluetooth works. I'm also able to get the 4K display here working at 60 frames per second. And as you can see here, we can do all the stuff we were just doing on the Windows side, on the Linux side, and everything seems to be performing quite well here. So if you were intending to maybe get one of these things to play around with Linux, maybe booting up one of those cool gaming or retro gaming operating system options you have now, this is probably something that can do that for you along with just running other OSs quite well here on the hardware. So all in, a decent little mini PC. The only knock against it is the Wi-Fi performance, but otherwise everything from gaming to casual work all seem to be quite capable on this little box. That's going to do it for this one. Until next time, this is Lon Seiben. Thanks for watching.